Hello, this is your humble host and narrator, J.T. Wheatley, and welcome back to another episode of the History of Comic Books podcast, the 2000s to modern day. This is where things get a bit tricky, as it's true what they say, history only happens in the past, as you never know when something is important until years later. Thus, the closer we get to present, the less we're able to distinguish between what is historical and what is not. Nevertheless, here we go. The 2000s opened with some good news when Marvel emerged from bankruptcy and enjoyed the success of the X-Men movie released on July 14, 2000. With Joe Quesada as the new editor-in-chief, Marvel left the CCA for their own in-house code. With that, they launched the Max line, which allowed them for more concurrent content, most notably Alias, on November 2001 by Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Gatos, which introduced the character Jessica Jones. Also, in October of 2000, the Ultimate line was launched with Ultimate Spider-Man by Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley, with the design to update the classic Marvel heroes for modern times as a separate universe. The line would continue to 2013 when it was folded and its remaining characters, notably Miles Morales, the new Spider-Man, into the Marvel reg- regular line. Outside of comic books, The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon on September 19, 2000 was released, a fictional tribute to the golden age of comic books that was so good he was hired to work on the Spider-Man 2 movie, but more on that later. With DC, the cartoon series Static Shot premiered on September 25, 2000 on the WB, with the Justice League following on November 17, 2001 on Cartoon Network. All part of the same animated universe started by Batman animated series back in the early 2000s. It converged into Justice League Unlimited on July 31st, 2004 on the Cartoon Network, which featured nearly every DC character from all the previous series, becoming a dream for DC comic book fans everywhere. Also of note was the premiere of Smallville on the WB, the channel that will become the CW on October 1st, 2001, which depicted a young Clark Kent growing up in his own hometown. On the comics front, the Hush storyline launched in Batman number 608 on December 2002 by Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee, introducing the new villain Hush. At Image, The Walking Dead launched on October 2003 by Robert Kirkman and Tony Moore, which dealt with a world suffering a zombie apocalypse, quickly becoming one of the most successful Emmys comics in years. It later inspired The Walking Dead TV show on AMC, which premiered on October 31, 2010. Perhaps the biggest news with comics came in the movies and TV, with Spider-Man opening on May 3rd, 2002, at a record-breaking $100 million for the opening weekend, quickly becoming one of the most successful comic movies of all time. It was followed up next that year, number the next year, by X-Men United on May 2nd, 2003, and Spider-Man 2 on June 30th, 2004. Suddenly, Marvel and comic movies were big business, and DC wasn't far behind with the review of The Batman Begins on June 15th, 2005 by Christopher Nolan, and its sequel, The Dark Knight, on July 18th, 2008, considered one of the best comic book adaptations ever. With Heath Ledger, who sadly passed away after filming was completed, receiving a post hominous Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his brilliant portrayal of the Joker. WBDC did try to reboot Superman as well with Superman Returns on June 28, 2006, but with middling results. Other comic books outside of Marvel and DC got their shot as well, with Hellboy premiering on April 2, 2004, followed by its sequel, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, on July 11, 2008. Frank Miller's comics saw some success as well in the movie scene, with Sin City premiering on April 1, 2005, which was co- he co-directed with Robert Rodriguez, and then 300 on March 9, 2007, directed by Zack Snyder. Meanwhile, Marvel got into the filmmaking business full-time with the formation of Marvel Studios in 2004, with the intention of financing and producing their own movies of their characters. The first films with the new studio was Iron Man on May 2, 2008, and The Incredible Hulk on June 13, 2008, which opened not only the critical and commercial success, but laid the groundwork for the shared universe in all the films taking place in the same world, just like in the comic books. Continuing with Thor, Captain America, and the Avengers, it has since become the most successful film series in movie history. All this took place as Disney acquired Marvel in 2009. Now, all the news was good, however, as Acclaim Com- Entertainment went defunct in 2004, taking Valiant Comics with it. Thankfully, the company quietly returned the rights of Solar, Magnus, and Turok back to Gold Key. In 2005, Dinesh Samadzi, excuse that pronunciation, and Jason Kothari purchased the rights and rehired Jim Shooter to help reboot the line in 2007. 
By May 2012, Valiant returned with brand new comics, absent the Gold Key characters, whose company was acquired by DreamWorks in 2012. Back on the comics front, Digital started to gain ground, and Marvel launched Marvel Unlim- Digital Unlimited in 2007, which allows subscribers digital access to all of Marvel comics for a monthly fee, similar to Netflix with movies and TV. Filmmakers also bled over into the comic books, with J. Michael Straczynski taking over Amazing Spider-Man on March 30th, 2001, Josh Whedon getting his own run on X-Men with the Extanching X-Men in 2004, Reginald Hudlin relaunching Black Panther in 2005, and Richard Donner, the director of Spider-Man, Superman the Movie, doing a run on the comic in 2006. Of course, crossover events were still happening in comics, most notably Infinite Crisis by DC in 2005, which attempted once again to reboot the DC line, followed up by the weekly comic book 52, which covered a week and issue in one year of the DC Universe, ending, in, ending up being one of the biggest success of comic books in recent years. Over at Marvel, Civil War was published in 2006, pitting the superheroes against each other as the government decides to finally regulate them. Meanwhile, Disney was enjoying the success of buying Marvel when The Avengers premiered on May 4, 2012, quickly becoming the most successful film in the company's history. In 2013, they bought Lucasfilm, which included, at the time, the rights to Star Wars, which resulted in Dark Horse losing the license, who naturally reverted back to Marvel in 2015. October 10th, 2012, the CW launched Arrow, a new live-action series based on the Green Arrow character. So successful, it spun off The Flash in 2014, Legends of Tomorrow in 2016, and eventually brought in Supergirl from CBS after its first season in 2015. Black Lightning has become the most recent addition to the CW universe. Back at comics, DC tried to reboot their line again. This is becoming a drinking game. With the new 52 on June 1st, 2011, which relaunched every series from number one. It ended in May 2015 with the old continuity returning again. On the film front, WBDC tried to emulate MCU's success by first launching Man of Steel on June 10th, 2013, meant to launch a DC cinematic universe like the MCU, followed by Batman vs. Superman on 20, March 25th, 2016, and then Suicide Squad that same year, and Wonder Woman on June 2nd, 2017. While, most, while mostly successful financially, they were reviled by critics, with the exception of Wonder Woman, which is quite good, and divided fans over their lack of continuity with the comics. It appears to have ended with Justice League on November 17, 2017, which is both a critical and financial failure that was in nothing like what the Avengers were. As of today, the DCEU plans are up in the air, with WB considering ending the shared universe altogether. That wasn't the case with Marvel, who on uh, February 16th, 2018, lost to Black Panther, and has since become one of the most successful comic book movies of all time. Meanwhile, Marvel also teamed with the streaming service Netflix in launching a series based on their own street-level superheroes with Daredevil premiering on 2015, followed by Jessica Jones, Luke Cage in 2016, Iron Fist in 2017, and finally having them all team up in the, Avenger- the Defenders on August of 2017. While well, Disney has since announced plans to launch their own streaming service, by all reports, these series will continue on Netflix. And that brings us to present day. Like I said, it's a bit tricky just what to touch on, and most of it seems to have been taking place outside of comics. Well, if you're still with me, thank you for following this brief but winding road to the history of comic books. Now, as promised, we're going to double back with future episodes, beginning with the character that launched the Golden Age as we get to the origin of Superman. Changing up our presentation while keeping the candidness that you enjoy. We'll cover all your favorite shows and movies with maybe a few surprises along the way. And you, yes you, will have opportunities to be on our show on a regular basis. That's right, you've got the Zoom Pro account and we're going to use it. So be ready. Find us at nerdblisspodcast.com and esonetwork.com. And on all the socials at NerdBlissPod. NerdBliss, listen up. And now it is May 30th, 2024, time for the favorite comic of the week. Ultimate Spider-Man, number five, by Jonathan Hickman and David Messina, which is actually a uh, flashback story that gives the origin of the Green Goblin Harry Osborn as it goes to showing how his uh, parents were killed and that he ended up taking over the company and eventually morphing into the Green Goblin. 
This is a great world building issue from Hickman that not only explores uh, Green Goblin's character, also introduces another classic uh, Spider Man character, and also emphasizes more of uh, Harry Osborn's wife, uh, Gwen Stacy, who's a bit darker in this universe than in the other universes. And it's a nice twist on the character, though it also feels very natural with uh, considering her past in the original 616. It's matched greatly by David Messina's art, which is not as dynamic as Mark Tuchetto's uh, more action-packed uh, art as the regular artist, but it's perfect for his more personal story. And this works great all around. And this is great world building issues leading up to issue number six, which is going to be like the conclusion of his first story arc. Can't wait to see it, of course, with Chick and Cello returning. And uh, all in all, just uh, this comic book in general is just a breath of fresh air, considering how messed up the uh, mainline Spider-Man books are from Amazing Spider-Man to that awful jackpot black cat mess. Avoid those. Not worth your money. Just stick with Ultimate Spider-Man for right now until they finally write the ship. Because this is everything Sp- uh, Spider-Man should be. And it's so great to just... Just a breath of fresh air. It's all, all good. And uh, with that, we'll conclude with this uh, episode of the uh, Archives. Join me in the next week for... Uh, now that we've done... Go and revisit the old uh, mainline uh, history episodes. We're going to be uh, probably bouncing around uh, more in line with, with the, the times and things and something like that. Of course, next month is uh, LGBTQ uh, Pride Month. So we we'll, might have something for that. We'll see. And uh, if not, uh, go out and enjoy some good comic book. And once again, check out Ultimate Spider-Man. Because if you're a Spider-Man fan, uh, it's great to have at least one good comic book that stands and represents the character.